Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second ISO webinar, this time on organ case design. Uh, my name is Pierre Paul, and I will be your host today. Um, but I would like to introduce today's presenter. Uh, Didier Grassin joined the NOAC organ company in 2011 with more than 25 years of experience in organ building, trained in a variety of European uh, workshops. Uh, he came to head the, uh, the drawing office at Mander Organs in the United Kingdom. Uh, from 1996, he spent several years as freelance designer working for many major European and American firms before joining Casa Vanfrère as director of Tracker Department. His design um, can be seen in England, France, Japan, Malaysia, China, Canada, and the United States. He has served on the editorial boards of the International Society of Organ Builders and the Institute of British Organ Building. He was vice president of the ISO from 2010 to 2014 and has been elected president at the 2016 London Congress. TDA holds a Master of Sciences uh, in Acoustics from Southampton University in UK and a Diplôme d'ingénieur from Université de Technologie de Compiègne in France. Uh, Didier became president of the NOAC Organ Company at Fritz Retirement in January 2015. I also wanted to inform you that a recorded version of this webinar will be available on Facebook and YouTube. Also, don't forget to join our ISO member Facebook group. At the end of the webinar, you will have access to a short survey for you to complete, and we'd love to hear from you. Also, our third webinar will be presented at the beginning of next year by French organ builder Michel Jurin on 19th century French reed voicing. For those of you um, uh, just joining us, welcome. And now I would let Didier start this presentation. Hello, everybody. Now, yeah, okay. That thing is a bit better. I think the mic was was muted. Uh, hello from. Uh, from the north of Boston, and thank you very much for uh, joining us today for indeed for that uh, second webinar. We're going to explore some facets of organ uh, case design through an analytical prism. Uh, we're going to split the webinar into say, two, two, two parts. The first part is going to be about 40 45 minutes presentation, and hopefully, we'll have after that uh, questions and answers. Uh, part, which uh, would be very interesting to hear from, from your side and how you, you respond to, to what uh, I presented. So do not hesitate to post your questions. Uh, Pierre Paul is going to uh, collect them, organize them, and, and pass them along. So let's start. Uh, you may wonder why the first image uh, that welcome you on this webinar is a painting from Rembrandt. This is the famous uh, white uh, night watch. Uh, which is in Amsterdam. Now, we're not going to uh, study how Rembrandt painted it, but rather why he made it. Because the circumstances of the genesis of the masterpiece illustrates uh, actually very well one of the fundaments of, the, of organ case design that is often forgotten. So this uh, painting, so I'm going to just move on and just keep this painting is actually uh, quite massive. It is something like four meters wide and 3.5 meters uh, high. And it was not hung in someone's, some, somebody's home, but it was a place in uh, the Musketeers meeting hall in Amsterdam. A very public place indeed. And you can imagine that anybody walking through the hall just, just could not uh, miss it. The painting was commissioned by a group of very wealthy citizens of Amsterdam, and they pay 1,600 guilders, so something like $100,000 to have it done. And they chose to appear on the painting all together rather than posing individually. It was very much a, a community endeavor. Now we can uh, maybe think that those 16 guys who paid to appear were possibly art, uh, art lovers. Uh, they are probably uh, using uh, art to convey how powerful, dynamic, rich, affluent, sophisticated their community was, and they wanted the world to know about it. 
the goal was not to make a masterpiece. The goal was very much to tell the world about themselves. And they asked Rembrandt to do that on their behalf. Now, 30 kilometers uh, west of uh, Amsterdam, between Amsterdam and the sea, is the city of Harlem. Now, a few years later, the leaders of the city of Harlem were starting to be a little bit irritated because all the limelight was on Amsterdam and nobody knew enough about Harlem. So when they decided to present themselves to the world, they chose uh, to commission a pipe organ. And the pipe organ is possibly the most complicated, probably the most expensive machine that you can buy at the time. Now they commissioned this organ to organ builder Christian Muller. And suddenly he fulfilled the bill. Regardless of the tonal quality of this instrument, anybody coming to Harlem would just be in awe in front of the case. I mean, just imagine, it is 30 meters high. It is, has full uh, size uh, characters being carved. Uh, it's actually dripping with gold and, and, and sculptures. And it is crowned by nothing else, the coat of arms of Harlem. So I don't know how much the elders of the city of Harlem were organ aficionados, but I'm pretty sure that they wanted that the look of their fancy new instrument showed their wealth and their sophistication. So the pipe organ is most of the time a community instrument. Its facade is a public display of that community. It is the reflection of that community. It is the vector which carries a message. And this is why the visual design of an organ imports so much to the client who finances the organ. The tonal aspect can be even secondary to the people outside the organ world. Now, if we go around the world, I mean, you can just imagine all those uh, instruments and see it perhaps in a different perspective. How did the people who actually commissioned those organs want it to wanted to, to see and wanted to convey. So here you have in the middle of 16th century, this incredible organ case hang on the side of the cathedral in Chartres. Or an organ for a king in the Frederiksborg uh, castle. Or an organ for a civic uh, place for a community in England in the middle of the uh, Victorian era where people are so proud of their engineering uh, and, and their wealth, the community gathered together to create those halls and puts an organ in the middle of it. And they were not small organs. If you're the Duke of Marlborough in your Blenheim Palace, you would have an organ. Or maybe even an organ for the Pope, although that one was never made. or an organ for mammon. Here it is, the Wanamaker store in Philadelphia, very famous, very large instruments. This is the place you can buy your underwear and uh, have the background of organ music if you want to. I think I'm going backwards. So what we learn is ultimately designing an organ is telling a story. The success of the case design rests on the success of telling the right story and telling it well. Now, we are a long way here from the rules of their principle that uh, all the uh, division of the organ should be appear in the case. We are a long way from any rules that, I don't know, facade uh, pipes should have the body length to be at the right, whatever. This is something much more fundamental than that. We, th this is about telling a story, telling the right story, and telling it well. So if you want, let's go through, through uh, uh, some, some examples. And now I'm going to ask you to look at those pictures, not as an organ builder, but much more with a, a child-like approach of things. What does those cases actually say? And no doubt there is some exuberance in that thing, it's nearly like a, a wedding cake, which contrasts very strongly 
with this modern instrument, which fits perfectly well the uh, simplicity of a Benedictine uh, monastery. What does it say when you build a Greek temple in a church in the middle of 18th century Paris? I'm not quite sure what the citizen, or the, 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 the parish of uh, Portsmouth uh, wanted to do there. I'm not sure they ultimately wanted to add up with a smiling monkey in their church. Maybe an unfortunate design. But what it is here, pretty jazzy uh, uh, case design. What does it say about the community who um, organized it? Or that one? I have to say, I actually feel slightly physically sick <laughs> looking at that case. Um, it's, it, it's so odd. I, it's not that it's ugly or, or beautiful. It just makes me really ill at ease. And this is a very famous and uh, 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 something which created a lot of controversy when it was done in Los Angeles uh, by uh, the organ, which was uh, partially designed with Frank Gehry. And actually, I'm going to ask uh, people uh, there, you have a, a way of voting there. And I'll, I will be intrigued to know how many of you like or dislike that, uh, that uh, design. And we'll come back to it uh, later because actually there's a lot to, to be said about that. So press the button, we'll, we'll see how it, um, it goes. I would like to uh, start by introducing what I found is one of the most important thing in uh, organ design. If you had to forget anything uh, from that uh, webinar, maybe if that would be one thing maybe you want to, to remember. This is what I call the three levels of perception. It is not quite, uh, not very different from uh, what uh, Raymond Glatigus used to call the zoom effect. Say, th this is not only true for organs, it is true for anything. If you go in um, a museum, say, and you enter the, the one of the hall, and maybe you see from the other side a statues, and it's something which is appealing to you, maybe the outline, the proportion, something, but you don't see it very well. So you go and you're going to journey towards that object and you're going to, through that journey, discover a second level, which is the detailing, the, the, the fine details of, of the sculpture. And if you carry in the journey, because you're interested, you're going to discover the texture of the material that was used. I do believe that this journey is in a very important uh, journey going through those three stages in order uh, to uh, enjoy the object. And that journey has to be made. So in an organ that would look like, maybe you'll see the outline, the proportion of a case, and will you go closer and you will see the discover the detailing and you'll go closer and you'll go and discover the texture. These three stages need to be fulfilled if you don't want to lose your viewer uh, halfway through. If one stage is missing, you will be frustrated, you will, be, uh, you, will have, you will lose your interest and you would walk away. So those three stages have to happen and they have to happen in that hierarchy, in that order to be uh, fully uh, successful. Actually, there is <clears throat> further stages uh, and you see that when, uh, when, for example, you install an organ and people, some visitors come and they start to, to look at the organ, it's very intriguing, and they come and they talk to you and what they do, they touch the organ. They want to touch, there is a sort of normal, uh, we are ingrained, it's hardwired, we, we have this uh, longing for having a fully sensorial uh, uh, experience with the object. This is why actually in museum they say don't touch, there's small little labels. Now, if you want to, to go a little bit further, the psychologist, and you can see that even yourself, if you have a little one-year-old uh, toddling around and discovering the world, they go, they touch, they smell, and they put in their mouth. That will be the level, the, the next levels. But we're not going to go there. We're not expecting to people to jump on, on any organs. 
those three levels are very important. And if you miss one of those levels, I say that it's most likely that you'll have difficulty to have a successful design. Now, let's look at some, some example where, for example, here you have the uh, detailing is nearly overtaking the outline of the uh, instrument. You lose the overall form, shape of the instruments because it's completely overwhelmed by the detailing. Well, here you have a very nice uh, hierarchy of, of stages. You have definitely a clear sense of what the shape it is about. If you go forward, you, you can see all the carvings. And if you go forward, you can see the marbling, which here is different, where the marbling is so strong that actually you lose sense of the detailing and you get confused. One of the issues I have with <clears throat> modern cases, especially in America where we use a lot of red oak, is actually red oak picks up uh, stain in a very different way. The, the, some grains are tender and picks up more uh, uh, stain than others. And you add up with a sort of zebra effect, nearly like a formica, and that is not very happy. This is where the texture takes over the, again, over the detailing. So if we look, in uh, uh, the, the toolbox uh, of the case designer, uh, there is various ways of where we're going to shape the organ in order to uh, serve the message that we have decided to do. And I've uh, distributed those tools in two groups. One is uh, what I call the tangible attributes. The other one is called the intangible attributes. The tangible ones are the one you can, the, 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 you can quantify them. You can nearly measure them. The other one, you'll see they're more open to debate, more subtle. So let's go. One of the uh, first truths about organs and actually about a lot of things, like in haute couture, uh, uh, if you have uh, the vertical, it is going to be very important. Uh, this is why in haute couture, they use very tall and slender models. It is not because uh, the couturiers love anorexic people, but it is just because clothing look good when they are on tall and slender people. It is going to be the same thing uh, with, with organs. So we will have, each time we will be able to uh, emphasize verticality, we will have a better time organizing our design. A few obvious examples here, Alkmaar, with everything is there to enhance the verticality of the instruments. You will notice there is no horizontal lines whatsoever uh, through that uh, case design. It grows like a tree and it, and it goes up and up and up. Uh, even the internal flats, none of them are fully horizontal. Same thing here in this beautiful um, early 18th century case in north of France, and now housing a beautiful cavalier organ. You can see how each branch of the case goes up in a very uplifting uh, movement. <clears throat> I would like also to emphasize the fact that the top of the columns, the top of the, uh, sorry, the towers do not stop flat, but they have those uh, enormous statues. I think it's uh, King David on the left and maybe something like Saint Cecilia on the right. What do those statues uh, do is they act like hats. They basically uh, transit uh, from the very mass of the organ to the nothingness which is above it. And instead of having a, a very straight and harsh line, they act a bit like a lace, which goes very uh, gently moving from the mass to the, to the nothing. We will come back to that uh, at some point. You'll see it's, it's, very, uh, it's very useful. <clears throat> Another very wonderful example is in Arthur Hill design of the mid uh, uh, 19th century uh, Victorian time. Beautiful uh, instruments and fascinating in many uh, aspects. You will notice obviously slender bottom uh, and going upwards all the way to the cresting. Again, another cresting which uh, softens the top of the case towards uh, the space which is above it. Uh, but also if you look a little bit more careful at the movement of the pipe mouth of the flats, and you can see, I don't know if you see my mouth, in uh, this area here in on the uh, rec positive, positive to do here, 
you will notice that actually the small pipes have the small feet and the bigger pipes have the longer feet, uh, hence enhancing the, uh, vertic the, the, the uplifting movements, not something which is traditional, but something which is very efficient. In a modern case, you can have something which is which can be actually quite simplistic in its overall uh, proportion. But uh, John Brambo, through the movement of the mouth, created a lot of movement and a lot of verticality. I should add that this case also benefits from being very shallow. If you could imagine that organ being that much uh, deeper, it would bring a lot of mass. Uh, so when you have uh, the need to have an organ which is deeper, you may want to actually hide the, the further, uh, the, the back part, the bank having narrower, so it doesn't appear too much uh, at the front. On the other side, you have here an instrument which uh, emphasized a lot of heaviness. Uh, everything is, is massive from the size of the pipes, even to the size of the caps, which are enormous and it's tucked into its arch. No verticality here and not a very happy uh, outcome altogether. Now, this is an, inst uh, an instrument which always puzzled me. I never quite understood the design of that uh, organ. You have in between the console and the pipe section, this enormous impost, which is very heavy, very flat, uh, and, and bring the whole organ down instead of upwards. And I understand that maybe the organ builder didn't have the chance, the chance to have very big pipes uh, and was limiting to maybe to eight footers, but still those very horizontal line here is extremely unfortunate. So the second point I have is the, the focal point. It is important that when you read your object, it goes, your eyes goes somewhere. This is an instrument with an enormous focal point. Uh, it was designed by uh, the architect uh, Jean Marolle, and this is in Alpha d'Huez in uh, uh, the Alps in France. The whole thing goes together. The arch uh, you can see here of the building creating a niche and into which um, there is this instrument. Very difficult to do a figurative instrument. Usually they don't look too good. They look a bit naff. Here it works. Uh, the architects and the designer have been able to mix up materials and shape, and your eyes go straight right in the middle. Another very difficult site, uh, and you have to really uh, give credit to the designer. Not only the organ is on the side of the church, but if you look a little bit careful, you will see that at the top, the windows is even not in the middle of the arch, making the design even more complicated. Although the instrument is asymmetrical in some of the details, it is balanced and the designer was able to create a focal point, bringing the eyes at the center of the instrument. Well, there is definitely a focal point here, but I am not sure that the clock should be the focal point of such instruments. It ends up like if, as if you had a radiator and a clock on top of it. Uh, and the clock is even not in the middle of the arch. It just looks a little bit odd. Everything seems to be on the wrong, uh, at the wrong position. This is the Royal Festival Hall. Uh, this is an organ which is spread around a phenomenal amount of, of width, the whole width of, uh, of the hall. Um, I'm going to show you two, two photos of that. This is a photo before they did the recent uh, renovation and they changed slightly uh, the, the design. As you can see, there is a huge uh, band all coming all across and really emphasizing horizontality, if anything. This is a, an unfortunate design which happened uh, in the 1950s. What happened is uh, halfway through the construction, the uh, builders was told by the client, the City of London, that after all, the organ will not be behind a grid, but will be fully exposed. Uh, that put the organ builder in a very uh, difficult uh, position, and they had to expose what had been built, uh, unfortunately. The architect realized that there was an issue and created in the middle this sort of very odd uh, collection of completely out of proportion uh, pipes, something which they called curiously the monogram. 
And that was very much because they had an issue of finding a focal point. I have another photo of which is now after the renovation. Now you can see here that the focal point being on that, um, if I may say, silly uh, group of pipes, which obviously do not work. But obviously what's happening is the eyes go from left to right and right to left and look for something to grab. And if it was not for that monogram, it would have a lot of, of difficulty. I think the uh, renovation managed to reshape uh, the whole thing in a much happier uh, solution. Sometimes when the organ is actually exploded into uh, various elements, the focal point can be difficult. And the focal point end up here, what probably is something like the Brusberg. I don't know if those are, are um, shades, swell shades, but it is actually an anticlimax on the uh, focal point. This is another issue with when the focal point is uh, also an anticlimax. Here, there is, because the organ is fully uh, symmetrical and they put a, actually a, uh, a piece of timber, it is actually the, the center. So the focal point is pushed, your eyes are pushed from left to right and right to left, which I call the ping pong effect. You see that also very clearly in the next uh, uh, example, where actually there is an anticlimax. What should be the most important thing is actually nothing, it's a post. At the opposite end, you have so much going on here that your eyes do not know where it should end and just uh, meander all around the design in a sort of a, a restless uh, way. Here, a wonderful modern uh, uh, design where the focal point is, is, is absolutely wonderful. I'm sorry, my head is in front of it. Um, here, that's better. Um, you have both an uplifting, very strong uplifting movement, and the focal point is brought back to the console. Very clever, very clever. My next attribute is what I call articulation. Articulation is how you're going to shape the case to create a three-dimensional object, like a sculpture-like. If this is the part which is going to catch the light, and create all the interesting part of uh, the case. For example, here you have a case with no articulation and it appears basically like a packaging. So let's take already those few elements and, and let's make something out of it. So I created a little example, a little bit theoretical example. Here you have, say, a shape. Nothing to write home about, it's okay. It's a bit of height, bit of width. So you create an, you design an organ for that. So you can create a box, maybe you put a tower in the middle so it has a little, a little bit of verticality, but the whole thing is actually quite sad and down looking. So you can start by first uh, flipping the flats and you have a little bit more uplifting, but you have this odd, an uncomfortable uh, 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 adjacent uh, big pipes and small pipes, which seem to be out of proportion. You have also your central, uh, uh, your focal point is actually the center tower, which looks because of the geometry of the case behind uh, the molding. The molding, since all that is on the same plan, the molding has to go in front of the tower. So you can play only with the, with, with the moldings. You can actually mo move the molding a little bit. I don't know if you see that, that molding here. Maybe I can just recess it. Or you can do a little bit more. You can bring your tower forward a little bit. Coming backwards, you don't see, going forwards. You can see how your focal point has tremendously already increased. Now, if you flip your, your pipes in a different way, you have something a little bit more balanced. You can give up, sorry, I'm going too fast now. Uh, okay, now at the base, if you are going on the base and you split the base, you have nothing else is changed on, on the top, but you just change the base. You're creating a little bit more members, vertical members, which makes the thing a little bit lighter. Obviously, if you make a coving, 
you have a, even a, a better way to do things. But you end up with something very heavy and something actually too small to hold all that. So you're going to split those enormous flats, which just looks just too big, into smaller uh, compartments, smaller partitions. And maybe even if you can afford it, you can going to add some towers here, which will going to catch lights and shadows. Put some hats on, here we go. Back again, moving back with the hats. You in incredibly enhance the verticality of the whole thing between the articulation, which will catch the, the light and the shadows, the little hats, which will uh, um, uh, transition from the heavy mass of the organ to the air and the space above the organ in a more gentle way. Here you've got an instrument which has much more verticality and, and dynamism. We started here. It's exactly the same outline, the same proportion. And actually we can do that instead. This is just doing through enhancing verticality, using your, your, the articulation uh, to, to achieve that, that result. Next, fluidity. Fluidity is always a bit difficult to, to explain what's fluidity. Um, uh, what is fluidity in an organ, which is by essence a massive uh, non-moving uh, instrument. So let's say I'm going to different fluidity by its opposite. This is a non-fluid organ. There is no fluidity whatsoever. Everything is actually very uh, mass-like and, and uh, non-moving. You see that uh, that has been used a lot in uh, the uh, post-war uh, organ building, where there was an abuse, uh, to, in my mind, of what uh, comes out of the, uh, the bowels. It's a, a misinterpretation of the bowels movement, perhaps, and certainly of what we call the so-called Scandinavian uh, style, where so the purity was, was uh, uh, sought. Actually, out of purity came uh, something which was poor, and I wonder sometimes it was just a... Uh, an excuse to make uh, cheap cases. But there was uh, this longing for no decoration and, and straight line, but that created a, a non-fluid instrument, lots of rigidity. Um, uh, Gerhard Brunsema, who uh, used to work with uh, Jürgen Arendt for many years and then joined Casavant as an artistic director also for many years later, used to say, uh, when the curves come in, the profit goes out. And I think uh, maybe that is true, but when uh, the curves come, goes out, the life goes out with it too. And you will, we are so far away from any natural form, it becomes really harsh and rigid. Fluidity will help. So many uh, organ cases have been done with no decoration, no fluidity whatsoever. And that is, 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 is very harsh. At the opposite end of the spectrum, you have obviously the Rococo uh, Baroque uh, of uh, uh, South Germany. And you have various uh, examples of how they use fluidity even to the point of completely having the organ disappear inside uh, the, the building itself. Fluidity can be also expressed in different ways. You have here a beautiful example of an Art Deco uh, case in Alsace, uh, designed actually by an architect, if I if I am right. Fluidity can be also expressed in a very modern way here in the Garnier organ in, in Tokyo. Everything is, is round and fluid in many ways. This is an instrument I actually designed uh, when I was at Mendes so many years ago, it is a, a, a difficult site. This is uh, the Cathedral of uh, Urakami, which is part of Nagasaki. This is on a, near the park where the uh, atomic bomb was, was dropped. So it's a very uh, heavy historical place. The Cathedral is really not a elegant uh, building by, by any stretch of the, of the mind. And we were given a very low uh, ceiling. So I used all my tools in uh, cutting the, the, the width of the case, in partitioning it, articulating it uh, in, in many ways, and in order to avoid uh, rigidity, introduce curved flats 
at the top and worked with uh, Derek Riley, the, the carver, into the pipe sheets. So the pipe sheets are actually uh, very water-like, water lilies nearly uh, like, which hopefully counterbalances all the rigidity of the instrument. The uh, railing itself was actually solid all the way up here on the other side. And I was advocating for an open railing, which obviously would uh, allow to uh, disclose, to, to unveil much more of the, uh, the height of, of, of the case. And the architect came with this very odd neo-Romanesque uh, uh, railing, which doesn't have any relationship to anything. It's a very odd thing to this day. I'm very sorry I did not draw the, the railing. Next, contrast. One of the wonderful things we have in organ building is the natural contrast of materials. You have on one hand uh, the pipes, which are usually tin uh, or, or, or close to, to tin, tin, tin and lead, uh, and they have round section and they contrast very much with the wood, which will be usually more like square section. The, the metal, which will be cold, versus the wood, which will be warm. The metal, which is completely uniform, versus the wood, which is grained. And we will use that to create a lot of interest, and we will see tension uh, inside the, the design. This is uh, an organ that doesn't exist anymore. It used to be in, in Radio France in, uh, in Paris. And what I like in that design is this wonderful juxtaposition of various materials. You have the, the back wall, uh, the background uh, walls, which are textured. And then the pipes, all pure metal, very cold, two different kind, one tin and some in copper. And in front of it, this wonderful bas relief, I do not know what the material, I'm assuming it is stone, a slightly different color, and all that creating a very interesting tension between all the materials. Another wonderful example is this uh, small organ by Jemlich, uh, when you have the doors, which are made uh, of enamel, I believe, you have the case, very soft grain, uh, I do not know, probably sherry wood or something like that, fruit wood of some sort, which is very soft, uh, very sensual uh, wood, and the pipes, actually those pipes are not made of metal, in that case they are made of porcelain, uh, but the whole combination and composition of all those elements uh, provide a very interesting contrast. Depth, we talked a little bit about that, but let's come back to it. The depth is it's actually different from articulation, is how much we can see inside the organ, that the organ is just not a box, a packaging, but has to do also to, to intrigue the viewers about what could be inside. This is an instrument I've drawn uh, for a, 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 an organist in, in uh, America, a conductor, and he wanted to have his organ to be part of his collection. And this is, was modeled on the outside on a so-called Queen Anne's writing desk. And when you open the doors, you have this uh, wonderful contrast first between uh, the outside, all green and gold, to the red and gold inside. But I've got, I believe, a third photo which shows you, shows you something different. You can see here that I did not cover all the, the gaps with carvings and let the viewers have a sense of the organ has some depth. It goes inside. There is something going on inside. And I think that adds a lot of in, intriguing part in the experience. Actually, there, there's a wonderful uh, uh, story around the, uh, the gesso. Uh, all that has been designed by uh, Lucy Compton and she used uh, a sort of, uh, in the Chinoise style, the history of the building of the organ. So you see the organ being built in, in, in a workshop and being moved to uh, America on a, on a junk and so on and so forth. Lots of uh, nice things. The depth can also uh, be done here in the very famous Danam organ in Saint-Paul-de-Léon where he used uh, trompe and and this very intriguing uh, tiles disappearing into a perspective. He did that uh, in various uh, organs. Depths can also uh, means a layering effect. You have his, here, I think it's very successful layering effect, which actually plays also with the building. It starts here on the right with some blocks of the gallery and going back there. 
all that creates a wonderful uh, a layering effect and, and sense of depth. Consistency. It's important that actually the uh, design remain consistent through the, the entire uh, composition. <clears throat> and sometimes you end up with odd situation. This is an instrument where the organ builder was asked to have, the, to have some part of the cases being a continuation of the building. And you can see here the molding going on here and there. But in the middle, this is an organ. So you do not know actually if you're looking at a piece of furniture or a piece of the building and actually leaves the viewer in a subtly uncomfortable position. Um, consistency is also in the detailing. Here we have, um, I'm going to move so you can, you can see a little bit better. Um, you can see the, 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 the pipes, some of them straight, some at the angle, some are different angles, there's a shallow angle, a more pronounced angle. And I think this actually confuses the viewer. Why, as much as you don't want to have a matchy-matchy uh, uh, composition, you want to have a story which goes from one sentence to the other and, and links to one another. And now we move to the intangible attributes. Now that's a little bit more complicated. Okay, let's go. First one. Ten oh, that's at least that one. The first one is easier. It's tension and relief. As all uh, pieces of art, of anything, music, anything you want, you want to create a little bit of tension and 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 provide the relief in the same time. This is an example. This is uh, the Portsmouth Cathedral. So if you remember the uh, the smiling monkey that you saw the very early part of the uh, presentation. This is actually the back part of the smiling monkey. There is a narthex and they had some pipes there and uh, they wanted to actually create a case to, to, to organize uh, that section. That narthex is a beautiful uh, space, lots of, of light, but they use that narthex in many different ways. Sometimes it's used for services and sometimes it is used as a, a community meeting uh, a place. So it was interesting to create an instrument which would follow a little bit all those uh, activities which happen in that narthex. So I created a fairly simplistic case, as you can see, which is the back, can be read as the back of the other organ. It follows the arch, it took a little bit of uh, detailing from the building, but it remains fairly simple. It is not quite entirely uh, 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 traditional or historically based. I mean, you have this uh, curves which appears on the doors which actually can make it even a little uh, fish but if you open the doors you have something much more powerful and right in your face now those doors were painted by patrick caulfield patrick caulfield was a, a fairly uh, famous uh, art a, a british artist and he was asked to provide uh, the design for those doors i have to say at the beginning i thought that uh, something more along maybe a, a modernized version of a pre-Raphaelite uh, characters might be appropriate there. And I was a bit shocked at the beginning about what it appeared. But with time, I started to appreciate how wonderful uh, it is. Uh, this being Portsmouth uh, by the, on, on the seaside, obviously, you can see all sort of references to the seaside. We have the PX here, which is a, uh, a symbolism. Uh, I believe uh, for the ports of Portsmouth, you have what appear to be propellers, or maybe they are fish, and they have moon and sun and, and lighthouse. So there's a lot of references of, of the community. Oh, here we go again. That is somebody who listened to what the community is and what it, it meant uh, and what they wanted to represent in their organ. This is a fairly brutal uh, uh, design, and if you're not used to it, it I, the first time a lot of people had a really a lot of uh, difficulty about it. But you realize how much wonderful uh, tension it brings, especially when you come back and you can close down and you can cool down the whole temperature if you want by closing down the, the, the doors. Another wonderful example is this Joseph Schaeffer's design in Versailles Cathedral, which mix up very modern, nearly brutal brutalist uh, design of the organ, each uh, section being in sort of compartments, no 
carvings, no moldings, no nothing, very right, right in your face. And combine that with this utterly uh, Rococo clock at, at the back. And if you look very carefully, there is even some Rococo uh, design uh, on the walls at the back. The, the two combination is unbelievably powerful, and there is so much tension about that, but also a wonderful feel of, um, uh, of balance uh, comes out of it. You need to be a really self-confident designer to produce such, such design. One of the detail I like particularly also in that organ is actually on either side of the repetitive, this is sort of two bushes of shamad uh, pipes. They appear completely random uh, on the, if you look at it uh, like that. But uh, when I was so intrigued that I actually asked Philip Kleist to, to uh, ask him how those pipes are organized, because if they are random, how do you tune them? It's a nightmare. And actually he sent me some photos. They are organized in a very normal organ building way, but they appear extremely random. And that randomness, the fact they are just pushing out words, there is a sort of aggressivity in, in part of it, which also is counterbalanced by the sort of Rococo, here we go, uh, uh, two angels and their trumpets at the back. Oh, that is a very interesting thing. This is about breathing space. Breathing space, I mean, full of my breathing space. Um, Breathing space. This is the, the very important one. It is what we call the concept of Ma. Ma is uh, a concept which is used in Ikebana in the uh, formal flower arrangement, arranging art in, in, in Japan. And it's actually difficult to translate uh, in, in English or, or, or in, in Western languages. Ma is basically uh, the space around matter when there is matter, when there is no matter, there was, there was whatever an object and the space around that object is ma. It's not actually a real word in, in English or French or whatever to describe that. That is the breathing space and that is so important. This is the very famous uh, uh, organ in Valère in Switzerland, one of the oldest organ in the world. And you can see how much space there is around that composition. It brings, it pops it up. Uh, if that organ would be stuck in a small niche, it would not have the same visual impact. Lots of ma. Here, same thing, a tello in Budi in St. Thomas in, uh, in New York City. You, I'm not sure, maybe the, the picture appears to you a little bit too, too, too dark, but you can see so much space around the case that it appears like a little jewel and, and therefore has so much more power, visual power on the viewer. The, we don't need necessarily to have an enormous amount of space, but to have an arch to, to frame your uh, object is going indeed to bring it forward, like in here in that Noak organ from 1985. We come back to that uh, photo we had seen, Saint Antoine de Casvin in Paris. Well, obviously there is no ma, the poor organ has been stuck in its hall and it looks like a monster. Not only is it heavy, but it's stuck in its hall. Not a very happy solution. Reveal less to show more. I like to put that, that photo because I'm sure you will, follow, you will remember it. What do I mean by that? I mean by the fishnet stocking effect, the peekaboo effect. You have here uh, an example of uh, partially hiding something to make it look more intriguing. This is uh, used in, in many places, in many ways uh, about that. So here you have par partially some facade pipes where peer through a, a railing, which always intrigues. Um, I, this is an organ I did in China, in Ordos. I didn't quite get it co completely right. I think my, my uh, uh, slats of wood were just too dense. It doesn't reveal enough. I hit too much. This is the, also an organ I participated. Uh, this is the Kansas City uh, Concert Hall. And in this uh, hall, which was designed by Moshe Savdi, which is a big name architect and I don't know if I should say I designed the case or maybe Moshe Savdi designed the case and I try to do the best I can do with it. <clears throat> it has been uh, criticized as being a sort of a poor Disney uh, uh, design. 
what is uh, what was wanted uh, the, the goal was at the beginning to have the entire organ behind the, the metal mesh that you can see there and use lighting to bring it in and out that was not possible because it was not enough depth but we created a, a layering effect uh, of of uh, pipes when one hide the other one uh, usually in facades and traditional facades and cases, you have one row of pipes and that's it. Here we have several rows of pipes. And what I will try to achieve uh, in, in some ways is to have a movement between one another. So when you actually you walk through the wall, through the hall, you see those pipes because they are angled in different ways, actually moving, uh, visually moving one vis-a-vis uh, -vis the other one, creating a sort of movement like a, the wind going through that. I'm not sure the, the, the design is entirely uh, successful. I think there's some parts I like very much. Uh, there is some part I do not like. We can talk about that another time. But um, the layering effect and the hiding effect is to me something which can be explored in, in an interesting manner. Gender. Now that is a, a bit of an odd, uh, odd thing. Um, this is an idea I had some not that long ago, and I'm not quite sure what to do with it, but I'm going to present it to you. You'll, 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 you'll see what you want to do with it. This uh, happens when um, uh, some years ago, we, we were uh, chosen to design an organ uh, for Washington National. Huge space, lots of my ear, lots of interesting proportion, lots of verticality, that was wonderful. It turned out that we had a lot of difficulty with the, with the committee and we ultimately made about 20 or so uh, design for, for them. None of them managed to satisfy them. Uh, they actually had another round of design by another designers and actually ultimately nothing was built. By the by, this is not what it is. So here you have an organ and this organ was made, uh, the design was implying oak massive oak and wrought iron and lots of uh, energy into it and solidity. And I wanted to uh, combine traditional medieval materials, oak uh, and, and wrought iron. At the wrought iron, there were some little characters, maybe in a sort of Giacometti uh, style and pipe shades made of possibly uh, a glass. One other alternative to that was a, in a, a case which was uh, designed much more into more fluid way, more like a fabric would be uh, used to, to twist and turn. And very quickly it appears to us that one was more like a watchman, uh, maybe more masculine, and the other one much more feminine. So again, in uh, organ case design, you can play on how, which aspects of the two you might want to prefer for that particular, the, 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 the project you want to achieve. Now you can say that uh, this design by Caesar Pelli had a lot of fluidity and, and warmth and positive motherly uh, holding. Um, same thing here. Not quite sure what, what I will do with that, that attribute, but I realize this is an attribute. This, this is, can, be, can be perceived in some ways. So let's come back to that one. Uh, I don't know, uh, uh, Pierre Paul, if you have the, the result of our, our little thing, most people like it. Well, that's, that's, you know, that's, that, 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 that's a problem when you, you deal with, with organ builders. They like things. I can promise you, if you have a lot of uh, American organists, the, the proportion would be just the, the, the opposite. Because people just uh, didn't, uh, does not like it. They don't understand it. First, you have to understand that uh, if you've never been to, to Los Angeles, it's very difficult actually to fully appreciate that design. Uh, uh, I did not myself fully appreciate it until I walked myself in the building. You have to remember, this is a Frank Gehry building. So when you go to the outside, I should have uh, picked up a, a photo of that, uh, of that building. It's a metal clad, twisted ribbon in some ways, very uh, uh, Frank Gehry. So you, there is already some, some tension between the metal, which is quite harsh, and the ribbon, which is all curvy. And you, the, the, the whole process, the whole journey through that uh, building is going to be uh, a swinging journey from harshness and, 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 and hardness to softness. And you're going to enter, and I have another photo, which I'm going to show you now, of the building. So here, the building, when you can see it from, from, from the back, 
and you see this building, which is all clad in Douglas fir, very warm, very uh, lovely and rounded and soft. And you have, and you see at the end of that building, this ball of energy that the organ is. And if now I'm going to come back to my previous picture, when you approach that, uh, that organ, and yes, this is a journey, and yes, the journey is working wonderfully, uh, you will see that that ball of energy, which is spiky, it's actually not a hedgehog. It's not, it's not uh, something which aggressive because you realize that the pipes have been actually curved. And you can see the, all those curved pipes. And they appear not as much as spiky as petals. And you go a little bit further forward and you realize that in the middle, you have this very aggressive group of metal chamard sp uh, uh, sprawling in all sorts of uh, direction. And you're going to go like this on and on with that design up to the point when you're going to go to, to, the, to the, very close to the pipes and you're going to see they are made of this beautiful grain uh, um, of the Douglas fir. And as Manuel Rosales uh, told us many, many times, people would come and they would touch the pipe. That would be the ultimate perfect uh, journey from uh, being attracted through the doors all the way to the organ through a sort of, uh, uh, the, with a pendulum uh, uh, swinging from one end from being attracted and aggressed and, and, and held in the same time. So to me, indeed, a very successful uh, design. And on top of that, a design which broke uh, some taboo, allowed other uh, architects to explore uh, the fact that an organ in a concert hall doesn't need to be hidden behind a, a, a grid or look, or look like a, a radiator. So don't forget, at the end of the day, designing an organ case is first telling a story, it is telling the right story and it's telling it well. I think it says a lot about, for example, the Los Angeles people uh, in this Frank Gehry uh, organ. Well, I'm going to stop here. I've, I've already talked already too long. Uh, I'm hoping there is some, some questions coming up. I uh, hope you enjoyed the, the presentation. The floor is back to you. So if you want to transmit any question, maybe just use the raise hand button or you can just write your answer, open your question in the Q&A um, section of Zoom. They all fell asleep. <laughs> oh, we, we have a question from uh, Noel. So Noel, go ahead. Hello. So t tell us your question. Hi, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm just... Uh, <laughs> we lo we're losing you, Noel. Hello. Hi. Hi, you listening to me? Yes, yes, we, we're here well. Yes, yes, and no, just, I just wanted to, to thank um, and um, he spotted all the main things and it was very interesting. I have no questions and just, just to thank for this, uh, and this interesting presentation. Thank you, you're most welcome. Thank you, for, thank you for the comments. I can see here a question. Often you see organs hiding the nice rosas. What do you think about it? Well, I think we could do a full session about uh, organs and windows. And actually, I'm thinking about developing, a, a, developing it at some point. Um, this is an ongoing problem. I'm sure everybody here has, uh, has faced when uh, the organ window is called. It says, here, you have the gallery. Oh, by the way, do not cover the window in any way, shape, or form. And this is a great, uh, a great pity because what uh, ends up is actually they force the organ builder to build the organ outside the window. And if you think about it, this is not how we treat window. This is not what we, we do in the rest of the life. If you go, if, if, you, if you be in your home uh, and you look at the, at the window, 
you realize actually you put some curtains in front of the window, which will cut a little bit on the corners of the window. Maybe you have a, a sheer veil, which will soften the windows. And maybe you can even probably place a piece of furniture, say an armchair in front of the window. And what do we do through that is we create a sense of perspective. There is a, a layering effect from the, the piece of furniture, the first curtain, the second curtain, the windows and the outside world. And by placing all those elements, one slightly in front of each other, one slightly um, encroaching uh, in, in each other so they can meld together, you have a wonderful sense of depth. And that is much more interesting. If you don't do that, you end up with the organ being outside the window and you have like if it was a, a little uh, shelf and you have objects side by side, you have organ, window, organ, and they don't speak to each other. And that is, is a great difficulty. It's very difficult to convince um, uh, clients about that. Uh, and it's a great pity because we end up with uh, unfortunate uh, design. I think I'll, uh, soon I'm going to develop a lecture on, on organs and windows because I think there's a lot to be said there. Uh, we have a question from uh, Guido. So how to approach this, uh, an asymmetrical design? I think that I think again that's another one uh, uh, which I'll be happy to talk about. Asymmetry is is, is something quite uh, complicated. I, I have, if you want, another lecture on on, on symmetry and asymmetry and why asymmetry uh, came and disappeared actually in organ. Because if you think about it, an organ is by essence in inside the organ is an asymmetrical machine where the base, uh, the, the keyboards is asymmetrical, the base on one end, the treble on the other end, and create the bass pipes on one end, the treble pipe on the other end. That is the first medieval instruments are asymmetrical in instruments. And very quickly we move towards a symmetry. So I have a theory why it moved to symmetry and why actually we came back to asymmetric, asymmetrical cases uh, in, in the recent uh, years. Um, what asymmetry does right now, today, in modern cases, it brings tension. Uh, and uh, when you don't have that tension, when your case is over-symmetrical, and there are some uh, examples of over-symmetrical cases, actually it becomes boring. You want to have a, some, some kind of asymmetry. Asymmetry is life. Uh, as much as we long for symmetry, it starts with Plato in the uh, uh, in, in writing of Plato with describing love as two parts, symmetrical parts. We need to come back together. There's a longing for symmetry. There is we are hard uh, wired to uh, to long for symmetry. We look for a mate which is as symmetrical as possible. There is some studies which show that if somebody is uh, people who are more asymmetrically visually symmetrical are more healthy than the other ones. It's very curious things happens. So we long for that symmetry, but actually the symmetry, if it's perfect, is death, it's nothing, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's the opposite of life. So we want symmetry, but not too much of it. So this is a very fine line. Uh, I'll be happy to talk about it another day as much as, as you want. So I think asymmetrical case nowadays is replacing uh, the lack of detailing, which used to be in the uh, traditional cases. We have stripped down our cases and are designed so much that it becomes so brutal and so harsh because actually when you have taken away those detailing, those carving, you remember King David on one side and Saint Sidney on the other, they are not symmetrical. They are balanced, but not symmetrical, huge difference. Uh, when those things have gone, what you left is a very harsh symmetrical box. And, and what do you do? You have lost the life. And I believe this is why uh, there is a renewed interest in asymmetrical cases, is to recreate the tension that we had lost before. I don't know if that is what was Guido's um, question. I hope that answers partially. Uh, we, we have another three questions pending, so we'll answer first William's question. So can you comment on the use of decorated painted stencil, stencil sorry, facet pipes as well as the use of decorated relief in facade pipes. It seems more American of, of an American style than a European style. Yeah, I, th I think it's, it's, it's very interesting. I had a lot of difficulty for a long time with Stenson's uh, pipes. And I'm going to tell you why, because I, I like that contrast between the, 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 the shiny metal and the wood. And when you're stenciling it, you're losing in that. 
uh, the, 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 wood, the, the metal pipes is nearly surrealistic in its finish and its shape. It's just perfect. Uh, and therefore, when you stencil it, you, you're taking away that because you, 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 you're texturing it. So the lack of texturing is gone, and I, I, I miss that. Having said that, if it's done uh, a little bit, uh, if you remember uh, the case in the Harthur Hill case in Chichester, only a, a portion of the pipes is actually stenciled. There are some also some, some wonderful examples. Uh, it, it, it becomes a style on its own after that. Uh, the one I, I love is the painting on Eton College. If you uh, go online and look for Eaton College, uh, the, the, the big hill organ is absolutely phenomenal, the quality of, of the stencil. And the same thing, Birmingham uh, Town Hall and so on and so forth. So I'm feeling a little bit awkward about it, but I understand where it's going there. Um, it, it, it's a style. So now two, oh, two. Oh, yeah, and, and also the same thing about the texturing. I think the texturing of the um, uh, the, the embossed pipes, I think that much was the second part of the question. I like it, but I think I like it in, in, in small amount. Same thing with the stencil. I like it in small amount. When it's too much of it, it's, it's overpowering to me and I, I lose the rest. But when it's done, when a pipe, one pipe here and there is there, it just adds a little spice and sparkle. So we'll answer to um, our last questions uh, of uh, Thomas. Um, classical architecture uses a lot of simple proportions derived from the use of a ruler and compass. Uh, how do you use that uh, tool in your toolbox nowadays? Ooh, that's a hot potato. I don't. Don't tell anybody, but I don't. Uh, I... I feel it's a little bit of an artificial thing, and I'm sure that a lot of people will disagree with that. And I, I know that some very clever designers really embrace it uh, fully. It never worked for me. It, 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 it's, just, it's, it's just math. You can prove whatever you want through that. You can always find a proportion of some sort which follows either uh, 1.2, 1.4, 1.7. It is square root of two, square root of three, or or, or golden section. Uh, there is always something you can fit there that that uh, goes. I don't believe that uh, that that is going to 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 make you a good design. I think the good design comes with the creativity and your good eye. And uh, some people have more capacity of of telling a good story than than others with the same tools. Um, you can have, everybody can be given the same palette of colors and some people will be Rembrandt and some people will be me and uh, tough luck. Um, so I think to me, the design comes from the eye more than, than anything else. But if maybe if that's a tool who helps you to achieve what, what you want to achieve and it makes you feel good, then, then do it by all means. I mean, there's no rules about that. And I would add to that about rules that anything that I've said there is no really any rules, uh, and, and if there is rule, it should be broken. But if you break a rule, the most important thing is you should know that you are breaking the rule, and you should know why you want to break that rule. Uh, if, if you do it because, yeah, maybe we can do break the rule without any reason, you're going to fall on your face. You need to know what you're doing. Um, two, two questions on uh, contemporary organ case designs. Uh, one question from Andrea, uh, uh, what about uh, use of new materials for modern uh, organ case design? Any suggestion, uh, for example, stone layers, uh, different metals uh, or something else? And also a question from Thomas, uh, what do you find most lacking in contemporary organ design cases? Well, first on the material. Go for it. I think uh, you've seen that little organ from uh, Yemlish with uh, porcelain, enamel, uh, and wood. I think, uh, think about how, which uh, material you're going to use. I think, again, that what is going to be about is, is the contrast. Wood, warmth wood with the cold enamel is going to be an interesting thing. Uh, I think uh, using um, there is some uh, beautiful uh, uh, veneer. Uh, Burr you can use to create some some interesting texturing, but you don't want to you don't want to overdo it. You want to show it off. So it always has to have a contrast. What is important in in a material is not to use that material; is to use that material in contrast with another material. I think that is what is going to be in my mind the most interesting. But I think you should go for anything. 
What was the second question? Um, the second question was about um, uh, what do you find most lacking in contemporary organ case design? Well, it depends where. I think uh, in 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 Europe, Germany, uh, Switzerland, uh, Austria, in all sorts of uh, places, there is a incredible uh, strong will to create something very contemporary, even in historical places. And I find that absolutely amazing. I find they are very good. Uh, they are very creative. Uh, some some of them are a little bit too harsh. But hey, kudos for, for doing it. Uh, I live in America where this is actually not an option. Uh, we have to be pastiche all the time. And, and that is, is a great uh, shame. Even a reinterpretation of something traditional in something modern is very difficult. So my many of the cases I've done in, in America, unfortunately, uh, follow very classical rules. At least I'm trying to uh, bring it a, a different way of arranging things which is not traditional um, but it's yeah we've got moldings and carvings and putties and everything unfortunately um, I, I think this it's a very society uh, driven oh hey here we go we're back to the to our story that i was uh, saying about it before people want that because that's what the community wants so uh, one last question for uh, today's webinar. Uh, good question from uh, Mr. Owen Woods. Uh, working up a case takes a great deal of time. How do you deal with the demands of the clients for draft case design at a very early stage in the bidding process? Yeah, that's a tough one. That's a tough one. I have some some colleagues refuse to do any drawings until the contract is signed. They have some. Uh, do the go the, the full way it is it, it is tough uh, i have seen uh example of contracts where it seemed to be it's been one on the design and because by luck or whatever uh it was a bull's eyes on what the client wanted to see visually uh, the, the message was just right in and, and then if you don't provide the design then you don't get you don't get the attraction of the appeal of, of the client so it's going to depend a lot about who you're talking about are you talking to the organist the musician uh, the music department or, or the conservatory or are you going to talk to uh, the people who are going to fund the organ who don't know anything about organs and they probably don't care that much if there is a bombard 32 a chest of one and three fifths or whatever what they want is the impact um, i've seen that in, in, in many ways so I don't think there is uh, one solution to that. You'll have to guess how to, to handle it. But it, it, it's a problem because it costs a lot of money. I mean, to, I don't know how it is for you guys, but it costs easily five, ten thousand uh, dollars $10,000 to develop a full-fledged proposal to, 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 some, uh, to somebody. So it's, it's a huge cost. So that, that will be it for our uh, webinar today. Thank you, uh, everyone, uh, for um, attending this webinar. Thank you, Didier, for making this presentation. Yes. And also, don't forget to uh, fill up the uh, quick survey that will be available just after the webinar or tomorrow by email. And uh, we, look, uh, we look forward to uh, seeing you all um, to our third webinar in uh, early 2021 on uh, 19th century uh, French read voicing by Michel Jury. It would be very interesting. Thank you very much for everybody for, for participating.